Hey everybody, I am Jarrett Ross, the Genie Vlogger, and this is vlog number 12. For today's vlog, I thought I would do a DNA results video. I originally did my test back in 2013, so I've had my results for a long time, so this isn't exactly a surprise for me. But I thought it would be an interesting video to show everyone my results and break it down from a genealogist's point of view. There are a lot of DNA result videos on YouTube. It's probably one of the most popular videos to do right now. I think a bunch of these uh, genealogy DNA companies are sponsoring a lot of them. So for 23andMe, MyHeritage, or Ancestry DNA, hit me up if you want me to do one of your DNA tests. For my uh, Family Tree DNA kit, I did three tests. I did the Y67, which tests 67 short tandem repeat markers on the Y chromosome. Um, so that gives you a pretty good idea of your purely paternal line for the past couple thousand years where you where you came from on that line. I also did the full mitochondrial sequence, which is the purely maternal line. So your mom's 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 mom, and so on. Then I took the autosomal DNA test, which is also known as the family finder test on family tree DNA, and that basically tests your entire ancestry. That's the test where they get the admixture uh, results, which gives you your ethnicity breakdown. That's the test most people use for finding cousins and seeing if you match with anybody. And that's the type of test that you actually get on 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Ancestry DNA. But if you want to know more about the differences between all of these companies, be sure to check out the comparison DNA video. So to start out, we're gonna go to the My Origins under Family Finder. My Origins is the ethnicity breakdown. And so they have it here where they kind of give you a brief explanation that they have 24 reference populations, that they break it down into clusters that highlight major historical and genetic events, and that's how they create your genetic tapestry. Right before I go into mine, I should just say that uh, you know, I have done a lot of my genealogy. Most of my tree doesn't trace back further than the 19th century, unfortunately. I'd expect from what I know to basically have Jewish diaspora, and I would expect maybe about six to 10% Sephardic ancestry. Although I know that's not gonna come up because the Sephardic populations that they have tested are mostly from Greece and Turkey, from what I understand. So going into my results, they have a general breakdown. For me, they have three Jewish diaspora, Middle Eastern, and then trace results. For Jewish diaspora, I'm 94%. For Middle Eastern, I'm 4%. And then trace results, 2%. And then they have this show all. So I'm gonna click that. And that shows the entire ethnic makeup percentage breakdown. For this breakdown, you can see that it even shows all the stuff where I have 0%. So I have no African, I have no New World, which is basically Native American. I have no Asian, uh, Central, South, or East. I have 4% Middle Eastern, which they break down further. They say 0% European, although it does show I have trace amounts of Southeast European. And then Jewish diaspora shows 94%, although it shows 0% Sephardic, which could possibly be the case, but they haven't tested the populations that my Sephardic ancestry is most related to, so they wouldn't be able to distinguish that Sephardi ancestry from that Ashkenazi ancestry. But as I learned at the conference from a couple of different presentations, it's going to be very hard for them to pinpoint that because those communities that were from the Western Sephardi world really aren't there anymore. And the people who come from those communities don't purely descend from just those communities. They come from all different types of communities, often multiple Jewish communities, such as myself. So going into the further breakdown, we'll start with the Middle Eastern. So it says 4% Middle Eastern, and then it says 4% Asia Minor. 4% is something that we usually consider from a genealogical standpoint as mostly noise. Knowing the history of the Jewish people, it's very uh, possible that this is actually from Asia Minor, just because the history of the populations migrating 
between uh, Europe and Asia Minor through North Africa, especially like the Moors coming up into Iberia. It's, it's very possible that this could actually be a representation of my Sephardi ancestry. It could also be partly a representation of my Ashkenazi ancestry as well. Then it has East Middle East, less than 1%, West Middle East, less than 2%, which are very trace amounts. And at that point, you're really just looking at what some people would call statistical nonsense, noise, artifacts, what have you. Looking at the next column, I've got European, and it has Southeast Europe at less than 1%. Now, because I've had my parents both test, and they both tested at high amounts of Southeast European, my dad actually uh, almost at 10%, my mom being a little bit lower, you know, it's not surprising that there is trace amounts of it. It's just statistical noise, and it probably doesn't actually tell me any real percentage of my DNA that is Southeast European because these tests really just are inferences. And then down below, we have 94% Jewish diaspora. Totally not a surprise at all. So from a genealogical standpoint, there really is nothing from this that I can use. Um, the only real thing that I can use from this is that it gives me an inference of Middle Eastern ancestry. So if I'm looking into the genealogical record for different sides of my family, it's very possible that I may find a Middle Eastern ancestor. And if I find hints of it in the paper trail, that matches up with the DNA and gives me the uh, hint to look for things that would show that connection. So that's the genealogical use of this. Beyond that, it's just kind of for fun. So going back a uh, page to the uh, My Origins page, there's also the map that we can look at. And this map is going to basically give us a breakdown of what we just read through images. So pulling up the map, we see three different colors over a couple of different areas. Mostly we see a big blue kind of blob right over Poland and then getting lighter as it goes out covering most of Eastern Europe. And this is what they're showing show the Jewish diaspora and over Turkey you see a very slight hint of green that's the Middle Eastern and specifically the uh, Asia Minor and then you'll see the gray over Italy Greece southeastern Europe and you also see gray over the southeast Middle East the eastern Middle East and a little bit of the west Middle East and so this is just showing a quick visual representation of that and when it comes to the autosomal testing the family finder tests the main genealogical component of it is the matching. Family tree DNA is one of the best ones in terms of finding matches. One of the reasons why family tree DNA is one of the better ones for the genealogical matching is because every profile that you match, whether it's on your family finder, your Y DNA, or your mitochondrial DNA, it's going to give you an email address where you can contact somebody. You may not always get a response, but one of the things with Ancestry, MyHeritage, and 23andMe is that people can make their profiles private. They can make it so that there's no way to contact them. And for a lot of people, that can be really frustrating to see somebody in that database who is so close and you have absolutely no way to even just send a message to them in hopes that maybe they'll one day see it. And that's one of the reasons why you'll find people who are using the DNA for their genealogy often on Family Tree because they want to be found. You'll often find them all over the place on GEDmatch and on multiple tests because they want to be found. So we're going to just go in and we're going to go into matches. So you should be able to see that it shows the most common surnames, which for me, I've got 92 people I match with who have the surname Cohen, 59 with the surname Miller, and 47 with the surname Schwartz. This is not uncommon, especially in the Jewish world. And then you'll see it has a breakdown of the matches relationship, their inference of it, their shared centum organs, and the longest block of shared centum organs shows whether or not you have an X match with them, which means if you match any of your X chromosome. Then if you know how that person is related to you, you can link to them through the tree on Family Tree DNA. And then there's a column which will show ancestral surnames that they're looking for. 
One of the cool things with Family Tree DNA is once you start matching people that you have a proven relationship with through the paper trails. So basically your DNA is proving what you already know through the paper trail. You can put that into the system and they will then be able to break down whether other matches may come from your paternal or maternal side. So for myself, I have a lot of cousins who have matched, who I know how they're related through the paper trail. As you can see, I have both of my parents have tested. I have a very close relative who is actually a third cousin once removed to me who is tested. She tests and shows as a first to third cousin. And then I have some other cousins which come from what is known as endogamy which is basically coming from a population that stayed within itself for a very long time. So the Jewish population is an endogamous population because no matter where they went, they really didn't assimilate much with the outside population. And if they did, they were no longer a part of that Jewish community. So what you find with an endogamous population is that you'll be related to people multiple times. So you may, instead of being a third cousin, you may be a sixth cousin three different ways. So you may share a set of fifth great grandparents with a person through your dad's side. You may also share a set of sixth great grandparents to that same person, but through your mom's side. And if you do a DNA test, they're gonna show up as a lot closer of a relationship than a fifth or a sixth cousin because they're both a fifth and sixth cousin to you. So that's what endogamy is. And with Family Tree DNA, it actually will show that by showing a purple square with the uh, image of a man and the image of a woman. And that indicates that they can tell that shared segments of DNA with that person comes from both your mom's side and comes from both your dad's side. So you know that even though it shows them as a second or third cousin, they're not really a second or third cousin, they're just a fifth or sixth cousin and another fifth or sixth cousin at the same time. So because I have done a lot of testing with my different family members and I've been able to put a lot of them into the linked relationships on here, it gives me a really good breakdown between my uh, paternal matches, my maternal matches and matches on both sides. I still have only been able to match someone through DNA and then find them through the paper trail once. Everybody else I've been able to find through the paper trail and then I use DNA to prove that link. So it's really hard to use DNA without already have something in mind to prove. Um, as Michael Waz said in his interview, a hypothesis that actually makes sense with the historical record. And using that, and the DNA to further research. So that's the breakdown of my family tree DNA autosomal results. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you do have any questions, be sure to put them in the comments below. I also am happy to pass along any questions you may have for any of the guests I have in my interviews. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. You can also click right about here if you'd like to subscribe. Please be sure to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Genie Vlogger. I am the Genie Vlogger. I'm out.